How's it going everyone? I hope you're all doing good. Welcome to another study session. In this one, we are going to be looking at the anatomy of the bones of the feet. Now, our feet are important. They support the weight of the body and allow us to stand. And as we evolved over time to be able to stand upright, our feet have adapted accordingly. In the previous study session, we had covered the anatomy of the hands, and you'll notice that because our hands evolve from being feet, that there's some similarities between the two. So it would prove useful to watch that video on the hands first if you haven't already. Anyways, here in the sketchbook, I'm drawing out the bones of the foot, and I've decided to approach this the same way as I approached the hands. Now, each foot is made up of 26 bones, which is a lot, but thankfully these can be grouped into three sections that I'll highlight here. These are the tarsals, the metatarsals, and the phalanges, and some of these names might sound familiar if you do know about the hands. At the wrist of our hands we have the carpal bones, whereas here this collection of bones is referred to as the tarsals. The bones in the middle are not metacarpals like in the hand, instead they are metatarsals. The phalanges of the foot make up the bones for the toes, the same as the phalanges of the hands make up the bones for the fingers. So these similarities make it easier to remember, and we'll look at each of these sections more in depth soon. I'm going to also draw these bones of the foot on two side views, the first being on a lateral view, looking at the foot from the outer side, and the second being on a medial view looking at the foot from the inner side. Remember, medial and lateral refer to how close something is to that middle line of the body. So, the reason I've drawn these two side views is because we can discuss the overall structure of the foot better whilst having these drawings to look at on screen. Now, the structure of the foot is a result of evolution from a, a need for it to function as we need it to. It needs to support the weight of the body, but also allow us to move. And so, it's these functions which influence its form. For example, we've evolved to have wider feet to help keep our balance, and this can be seen on this view of the foot from above. Now, as we walk around, more weight is placed on the bigger toes, which are closer to the centre of the body. That's why there is this arc shape at the end of the phalanges that curves down lower as we move to the outer side of the foot. In addition to this, we also need to be able to move, and so you might have noticed from looking at this on a side view that the foot is arced rather than flat to the ground. And this is because, well, I, I suppose it's a, a result of evolution, seeing as this arc helps us move around better in comparison to the foot being flat. However, when standing still, it's the outer side of the foot that is better at balancing the body, and so that's why there is more of an arc on the medial side, the inside of the foot, in comparison to the lateral side, the outside where it's flatter. And so these are referred to as the medial and lateral arc, and you can actually see this when looking at the foot, as well as how the inner side has a gap. It's also easy to see when looking at footprints. It's, it looks like part of your foot is missing, but it's just because of that medial arc. So that's some useful information to know in terms of the foot structure and now as I mentioned I'm going to start looking at each of these three sections more in depth and I, I might come back to this page later. Let's begin by looking at the tarsal bones and you'll notice that there's a lot of similarities here in comparison to the carpal bones in the hand. Now there are seven bones in this section that are arranged in proximal, middle and distal rows. Here in this sketchbook, I'm drawing out this section of the foot on both a top-down and a side view, and I'll label each of these bones, as well as highlighting them in their own colour. Starting with the talus in the proximal group, here this sits at the top of the foot, and I did make a mistake colouring this in on that top-down view. The section above what I've coloured is also the talus. You'll see that I correct that soon. Under this is the calcaneus, and we'll come back to these two bones in a moment to discuss them further. I assume you've noticed that they are bigger than the others. In the middle group, there is only one bone all by itself, the navicular bone. And it's here when I realised the mistake I had made, but luckily I was able to rectify this by shading in the talus section, like so, a mix between yellow and red, creating an orange colour. Anyways, in the distal section, there is the cuboid bone, 
And then there are the cuneiform bones, consisting of the lateral cuneiform, the intermediate cuneiform in the middle, and then finally the medial cuneiform. So again, you don't need to prioritise memorising these names. I'm also go over this because we are studying the anatomy and so it's good to refer to these using their names. Now, as I mentioned, some of these bones are worth paying attention to, such as the talus and the calcaneus. The talus articulates with the lateral and medial malleoli of the tibia and the fibula, the two lower leg bones that we looked at in an earlier video. This ankle joint is called the terocrural joint and it's a, a complex hinge joint composed of two articulations, these being dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. In other words, it lets us till our feet up and down. Some abduction and adduction movement is also possible, which means moving the foot side to side. The talus, as you can see, sits on top of the calcianus, also referred to as our heel bone. And these two bones form the subtalar joint, and the calcianus supports a large amount of the body's weight. It's also the largest bone in this tarsal section. So it's these two bones that take up most of the room in that tarsal section, and the remaining five bones are there to help disperse and support the weight of the body, and they also meet the metatarsal bones, which we'll look at now. So the metatarsal bones sit between the tarsal bones and the phalanges, and right away you'll notice some similarities with the metacarpals if you've watched the video on the anatomy of the bones of the hands. And not only when it comes to their name, but also their form. There are five of these, each being numbered from one to five, from the medial side to the lateral side. The medial side is where the big toe is, by the way, and the lateral side is where the little toe is. Now, I'm drawing these out here on a top-down view, a side view, and also on a front view, and you can see the size of each of these. The first big toe is the fattest, but also the shortest, and the one next to it, the second metatarsal, is the longest. Here you can see on screen how I number these accordingly. The ends of these then start to form an arc shape, again similar to the bones of the hands. The ends of the metatarsal bones connecting to the tarsal section are referred to as the base. There is a, a plane joint here referred to as the tarsometatarsal joint. It's a bit of a mouthful to say but this joint doesn't allow any movement though because most of the movement occurs in the metatarsophalangeal joint which is at the other end of these bones where they meet the phalanges. This is a, a synovial joint allowing extension and flexion movement for the phalanges. The middle section of these bones are referred to as the body. Notice how these metatarsals are bent upwards to help support the weight. They all face the ground, including the first metatarsal for the big toe, which is the thickest of them all, to provide more support. The base of the second metatarsal is locked in place by the surrounding ones, and finally, another important difference in comparison to the hands is in terms of the last metatarsal for the little toe. Here the base of this protrudes outwards slightly. So those are the metatarsal bones of the foot, now let's look at the final section of bones referred to as the phalanges. These are the bones for the toes, and you might remember that the bones for the fingers were also referred to as the phalanges, and again, they are essentially the same in many ways. Each of these phalanges are divided into three separate bones, each referred to as a phalanx. Here I'll shade all of these in yellow. So these can be separated into three groups. The first row connecting to the metatarsals are the proximal phalanxes. Then there are the middle phalanxes. And finally, at the end, there are the distal phalanxes. And you've likely heard these terms before. The big toe, however, in the same way as the thumb, doesn't have a middle phalanx. There is just the proximal and distal phalanx there because it requires greater strength to support the body especially when pushing off the ground when walking and running. So it's for the same reason as the thumb really, but of course, unlike the thumb, these phalanxes for the big toe face the surface of the ground the same way as the bones of the other toes do. Obviously this is because they are made to step on the ground, they are not designed to grab things and have the same freedom as the hands. 
So that's the bones of the feet and in the next video we will use all of this information to start drawing them. I'm essentially taking the same approach as I did when covering the hands so I hope that you found this useful. Again I do post a lot of study documents on Patreon that put all of what I cover in these tutorials on paper. With that being said, thanks for watching, I'll see you in the next one. If you enjoyed the content I create, then do consider becoming a patron on Patreon. You will gain access to exclusive tutorials, study documents, process papers, real-time drawing footage and more. Plus, you will also be supporting me in a more personal way. Other than that, thank you for watching this video and I'll see you soon.